Well, hello, my friends. Today, I think we're going to have a topic today. I think we're going to talk a little bit about these incredible creatures known as isopods. They are absolutely, in my mind, they are absolutely fascinating. And there's so much misinformation out there. I think today we're going to talk a little bit about it and hopefully clear up some of the misconceptions about these wonderful little detritivores. Now the ones we're looking at right now, these are my uh, my culture of Kubaris species, Panda King. They're not a formally described species yet. And uh, for me, they are rather prolific species of Kubaris. Now Kubaris, as I mentioned earlier, you know, little denizens of the forest floor, Kubaris generally are not. Kubaris are generally found uh, in Chinese, in China, overseas, in uh, different uh, limestone-type caves. They're, they prefer a lot more calcium in their substrate, and they prefer uh, a lot more moisture, as you can tell here. But as you can tell by this bin, because the population explodes, so do the resources for the animals. Now, as you've seen, isopods come in every shape and color. They're found throughout almost all the world, except for in some extreme, extreme habitats like the Arctic. And they are an integral part of the ecology of these environments. Most isopods are extremely resilient creatures. I think to have a better understanding of some of these animals, I think we have to take a closer look at nature. I think we have to get outside in our own backyards and take a little closer look to get a better understanding of how these animals have evolved and how these animals survive to this day. Why are some species so much more prolific than others? Some people keep them in Rubbermaid style tubs. Some people keep them in nature inspired vivariums. Some keep them as bioactive cleanup crew. Regardless of how you keep them or which species you keep, they are all equally fascinating. I've spent a great deal of time researching, reading, looking at articles, looking at habitats, trying to gain a better understanding, sharing that knowledge with others, sharing experiences with very, very well-respected isopod keepers so we can all learn from it and all get better. But I too learned through trial and error. I've made countless videos about how I've made my substrates and different videos of how I've gone and sterilized different medias and things like that. And honestly, a lot of those things have evolved and changed in my isopod keeping journey. When we bring in a new creature, be it an invertebrate, a goldfish, hamster, dog, cat, snake, doesn't matter. Even isopods, these animals re rely on us to provide them with all their things they're gonna need throughout their lives. Now, most of us start out with an enclosure similar to this. And we've been told to use natural bark type products, but yet today we still see people using cork slabs, which provide absolutely nothing of value. We see, uh, you know, we, we've been told to use different types of mosses as uh, moisture beds. And yes, we can use long fibrous sphagnum moss, but naturally harvested mosses offer so much more to the animals. And you can see a really healthy culture is great to see because it explodes and we have so many isopods. But with that poses all sorts of new challenges of ensuring that their environment stays stable. Now with this environment, with that huge population explosion, means waste products, overuse of resources. Same with people. 
most of us come from urban areas you know does that really look like a, a life well spent a life tried entirely surrounded by concrete not to me it doesn't getting out in nature and truly appreciating nature but if we overtax nature she has a struggle to keep up and when we're keeping them in captivity that relies 100 percent on us even my large-scale Marilunella, which is a Vietnamese species, comes from warm, moist forest. These are my Marilunella tricolor enclosure. Now, if you guys remember back and have followed me for a while, you know that I almost completely wiped this culture out by going away a little bit too long and the enclosure drying out. So you can see the enclosure has fairly deep substrate, about four and a half inches, about six at the back. It has been it was fully planted you can see certain plants have taken over and uh, really capitalized versus other ones have kind of struggled a little bit and some have just outright disappeared uh, i have i have talked before about uh, trying to close off some of the ventilation so it maintains humidity a little bit better but just in my few minutes of kind of poking around in here just trying to see you know how they're doing see if there's still some life in here i was able to find half a dozen Marilunella tricolor and of course now when we go and do that we won't find any <laughs> but they are still here they are slowly coming back because as i say we wiped them out almost entirely so they are coming back from some small young mankai there's one but they are kind of throughout this entire enclosure there's one there's another one there's another one so they will come back however that's thanks and due in part mostly to them being such resilient animals but there's some other excellent keepers out there that have been experimenting with different species trying to keep a species that requires warm tropical humid conditions in a climate in canada where our winters are cold and dry and forest air furnaces poses all sorts of other challenges but we have seen certain other uh, hobbyists that have tried different things like cool mist vaporizers warm mist vaporizers fog machines those type of things and applied those machines into these environments and made the environments a bit a little bit more closed and they've had incredible success with that because it mimics the habitat where these animals would come from better out here is where you're going to learn to be a better isopod keeper now, before we go any further, I also have to mention is like not all isopods live in a forest. Some, as I mentioned, like the Marilunellas hailing from mostly Vietnam and some different areas, Cambodia, Thailand, those areas they live in, in some will live in forest. There's going to be wet, warm forest. Some will live in caves. A lot of the Kubara species are so popular, live in limestone caves. Uh, a lot of the European species, which is the bulk of what most people start with, they live in coastal regions of France and Spain and so forth areas. There's often going to be limestone type cliffs and there's going to be all sorts of detritus and leaf litter and so forth. So when we start looking at the forest floor, we can get a better understanding of how to maintain a lot of these type of species in general by understanding the ecology of what we're walking on right now. All the leaf litter that everybody loves collecting, understanding what the actual purpose behind the leaf litter is, the leaf litter becomes the primary food source for a lot of the different detritivores. And you know, as this tree, this is a naturally fallen tree. Look at the great bark, all the different mosses and lichens and so forth became food sources. But this tree naturally fell on its own accord and it's been here on the ground. And this now becomes our white rot wood, which is so integral because it's already got all those bacteria and funguses contained within. These are natural food sources for a lot of these animals we keep, not just isopods, but even more critical would be things like ice, uh, like millipedes and stuff. Nice spongy white rot wood. This is integral, incredible product to be able to have available to you different types of bark slabs. These are exactly what you want. Stop using pieces of cork. Cork offers nothing of value. You, know, you can go out to anywhere in a nice forest or a park or something there, somewhere that you know is, a, is, is preserved that has not used any sort of pesticides or anything and harvest these types of pieces. Take them home. Do not put them in the, in the oven. Do not bake them. Do not do anything like that anymore. I know I was one that was a proponent of proposing those type ideas before, but what I do do now is I take these products, the leaf litter that we collect. And the leaf litter that we collect, I collect and use in two different ways. 
So I'll collect the whole leaves because they're ready to go. And everyone likes to, their own choice of leaves, but honestly, most of them are gonna be fine. Whatever's prevalent in your area. Oak tends to last longer than a lot of the poplar type species. The poplars, you're gonna get this large hard stem that's gonna accumulate because the isopods don't really break it down, but the leaf will be destroyed. You end up with a lot of these stems. But the other thing that I like to do is, so I collect hard leaves, and as you guys have seen in posts, I've collected four big giant bags of leaves ready to go for winter, whole leaves. But then I also like to bring out my uh, uh, leaf blower, reverse it, and I like to suck up a lot of these different types of leaves. And what it does is it turns them into a nice mulch. And I can get about four times as many leaves into a bag, but they're already chopped up pre-ready to go. So it makes a good, good source of food for a lot of these animals to carry me through the winter. All these different natural mosses. Now these ones generally won't, because they're coming from my type of a climate, they generally won't stay green long. Uh, in a terrarium. They will eventually brown off. But I will collect all these types of mosses, all that type of leaf litter, that mixed leaf litter there, all those different pieces of bark. You can see them here that some of them are, you know, not just this year's, but you can see as the forest floor has broken down over years, you know, there's fallen branches that have now been buried. There's leaf litter from years gone by, which has slowly but surely been turned into mud. But this type of product is exceptional. Don't bake this. Don't just pick the clean leaves. Take product like this home, the moss, and everything else that I've shown you, and put it in like a Rubbermaid tub or a bucket or something like that. Fill it with water, and then put another Rubbermaid tub or bucket of similar size and push it down over top to the point that all that material is going to be fully submerged. Let it sit for a good 24 hours or so, whatever, and that'll ensure that any of the malicious species, centipedes, different types of spiders, anything that requires air breathing will be killed off, therefore becoming also another protein food source for your isopods. But more importantly is that you're not going to be introducing those negative pests, which is why everyone is always talking about sterilizing these products. But by submerging it for 24 hours or so, that bacteria, that fungus, and all those incredible natural products that are so beneficial to these natural systems, those are all gonna be kept intact and that will create a much more healthier environment for all your animals. So all these leaves that you see present, all the grass that'll die off, any of the branches, the trees, anything that falls on the forest floor eventually gets consumed by the forest floor isopods, springtails, millipedes, all this microfauna that is all below our feet. And they are the janitors, the stewards of these environments. And they will break down all these products to the point that they are reusable by the other, other plants and animals. Now, when we're gonna keep them in captivity, everyone in the fall time collects leaves, collects bark, collects different things like we've just talked about. But not a lot of people are thinking about the different byproducts that are building up in these environments. The best way I can describe it is in the way of something like an aquarium. An aquarium, when you set up an aquarium, it contains no life. It's a glass box filled with water. But then we have to add some life. We inoculate it with a few fish. And those fish produce some waste products and gases. And those things are all toxic in that environment. And the environment is not stable enough to be able to handle that. And nor will it ever become. We will always have to be stewards to help that environment out. But over time, bacteria and things will form within, the different, uh, within that environment that will help maintain some form of a balance. But we will still have to do things like water changes and so forth. No different than when we are talking about vivariums, cleanup crews, and so forth. We have to replenish the amenities that are held within the substrate to ensure that the environment is stable. We have to ensure that the alkalinity or the pH or the acidity of that environment is stable enough for the animal in question. Some come from high alkaline environments like Kubaris with limestone and calcium rich environments. And some come from fairly acidic environments like anything that would be coming from a jungle forest floor. It is our responsibility to understand the ecology of that environment so we can be better stewards to our isopods. So hopefully that gives you guys maybe a little bit better understanding of some of the basics for isopods. I know I've done a complete 180. As we, you know, as we learn and we share our knowledge, we all get better at it. I fully understand that some of you 
may live in real urban areas and don't have access to a lot of these natural type products. So you have to buy them, that's fine. There's other products out there that are exceptional products, things called flake soil. Basically flake soil is taking a lot of those products and kind of breaking them down already, inoculating them with those bacteria and products and stuff to make them ready to go. Those things are exceptional, but you don't have to use them exclusively. Add them into your mixes, inoculate your mixes, and you'll be a better keeper for it. So till next time, my friends, take care. Uh -oh.